I no, can you can see, see you can see. So, so welcome to our session. Um, you you can see each other if you choose gallery. You go up to the wherever you have yeah. those options and just click gallery, and you can see. You basically can have the same view as you had before. But, but on identification, can anybody just to just blind, you know just erase their name name if they don't want their name on there, right? Yes. You can do that. Well, they can turn off their video and you can't see them. I mean, yeah, well, actually, if you turn off your video, you will see the name even more prominently. So okay. so anyway, so so that that's what I'm going to be doing for recording. And I am recording now. And the subject this evening are the Jewish movements. And um, I guess I'm always curious. We'll read some articles and I have my own views as, as you know, the issues of the movements. But what's your sense of what the different Jewish movements represent? Um, at, I don't even know if, if people want to discuss that, or we can. We what can, do you mean by movements? Uh, like reform, conservative, orthodox, and so on. Uh, okay, Bryce, and then Alan. I think of them as uh, uh, more or less strict adherence to practice. Okay, okay? and that um, as uh, and and that's the basic major divisions but when you get out to reform or and, and you've got minor subdivisions that divide along um uh what's the word i'm looking for uh not ortho ortho not orthodox the wrong word board but but they divide along some kind of uh not spiritual but scriptural or some way of dividing mm -hmm. themselves as being you uh, we have the right the writer way to find god Okay. Okay. Uh, Alan. So my understanding is uh, evolutionary in the sense that there have been Jews who practiced the Judaism various ways forever. But after the Enlightenment and the time of the French Revolution, there was a movement to inst institutionalize modernity, which originally led to be the reform movement. And then not, th not too long after that, the way in which reform modernized, the conservative movement identified some things that made more sense for another set of people, and then later the Reconstruction. So of the major movements, that's my answer okay. to how I see this. And then there's some obviously details, but none of the movements are the way they were created. We've all, those of us associated with reform, it's not the re it's not my father's reform, as you would say. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. My practice. One of the lines I often say is we are not reformed. In the Christian world, there is the reformed church, which is ED. And I, I often say if we were reformed, uh, uh, we would have stopped reforming, but we're still reforming. Um, so it's not past tense. Uh, Cindy. Uh, so I see the preference between the different movements as one of cognitive style, uh, hmm. kind of the continuum between concrete thinking and metaphoric thinking. And concrete thinking and what? Metaphoric. Ah. Okay. Can can you be more concrete in that? Which 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 is the most concrete and which is the most metaphoric? Oh yes, the more conservative and towards orthodox as concrete. Ah. God said it, and I believe it, and that's good enough for me. Okay. Okay. Um, and then metaphoric, looking for the message underlying it, looking mm -hmm. below the surface more. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's been a while since I actually read the articles, like about a week. So I'm not 100% sure what they uh, what they detail. But I, I will point out one thing which I think is interesting. And I don't remember if this is in the articles. First, very surprising. The oldest movement is reform. That will surprise most people. Um, because before then, people were just Jewish. And as, um, as somebody said, you know, some were more observant, some were less observant, but there were no sort of organized movements. Reform is the first one. And the second is there are no such divisions like this in the Sephardic world. This is strictly an Ashkenazi phenomenon. And as we, as we, uh, you know, as we get into it, we can discuss why that is. And, you know, I'll give you sort of my thoughts on that. So let's read the first article which is an overview of uh, the Jewish denominations. Uh, a quick look 
at Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Reconstructionist, Judaism, and other Jewish streams. Okay, so would someone like to read Jewish denominations? I'll read in that Thank case. Thank you, Alan. Okay, Jewish denominations, also sometimes referred to as streams, movements, or branches, are the principal categories of religious affiliations among, uh, um, I'm going to say, North American Jews. The denominations are mainly distinguished from one another on the basis of their philosophical approaches to Jewish tradition and their degree of fidelity to an interpreting of traditional Jewish law or halakha. Yeah, and I'm glad you made that point. I mean, we say American Jews, and I don't know that in South America we see these kinds of differences. It is definitely a North American major phenomenon. And in Europe, you typically will have liberal Jews and and you know various Orthodox movements and not so much of a difference between reform and conservative, although in Israel you do have all the branches. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's continue. Outside North America, the non-Orthodox streams of Judaism play a less significant role, and in Israel, the vast majority of synagogues and other Jewish religious institutions are Orthodox, even though most Israeli Jews do not identify as Orthodox. Agree with that. Um, even within North America, the role of the movements has diminished somewhat in recent years be, with in growing numbers of American Jews and Jewish institutions, institutions identifying as just Jewish, non-denominational or trans-denominational. Yeah, and, and I do see, you know, in 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 our community certainly in the US you will find m many synagogues who are not affiliated with a particular movement which is to say uh they are not paying dues to a particular movement as as some of you may may well know in the reform movement there is an organization typically each movement has a rabbinic organization. So in the reform movement, that's the CCAR, the Central Conference of American Rabbis. They have a congregational organization, which in the reform movement is the URJ, the Union for Reform Judaism. And then they have a uh, a seminary, uh, which for, for the reform movement is Hebrew Union College. And typically congregations like Temple Adad Elohim or, or others, uh, belong to one of the movements and just like people belonging to a synagogue and paying dues they will pay dues to the movement and uh, in the reform movement the lion's share of the dues goes to supporting the college or or at least used to i'm not sure if that's if it that's is, it's about it's a, no, i don't know exactly but about half of the money collected by synagogues that go to the urj directly go to hc to to us to to HUC for, to for, for training new rabbis canners and and educators yeah right right can you can you go back to the last uh, paragraph please sure thank you I, my question is if <clears throat> um, the vast majority of synagogues what do you do to me here oh uh, and other Jewish religious institutions are orthodox. Even though most Israeli Jews do not identify as Orthodox, why is that? Oh, why don't they identify it, or why are they? No, no, no. I understand why the Israeli Jews do not identify right, as right. Orthodox. I understand it. Right. What I don't understand is why the religious institutions are Orthodox when the majority of Jews in Israel do not identify as Orthodox. Okay, it's a, it's a very good question. So, some of it is is historical. Um, when Ben Gurion was was helping to create the state of Israel, he wanted the support of Orthodox Judaism, and it was it was a significant issue for many reasons. But one of the one of the ways he got their political support was to say that the only movement within Judaism that the state of Israel would recognize is the Orthodox movement specifically they would not recognize the conservative or liberal or reform 
movements. So, um, for example, I think to this day, uh, you cannot have a wedding in a reformed synagogue that will be recognized by the state uh, of Israel as a as a valid uh, wedding. Uh, Alan. And to respond to, I forgot who asked the question. Jay. Um, in, in other countries, even Canada, but especially places like South America and South Africa, the, the, the idea of uh, anything other than orthodoxy kind of came along later after World War II, whereas 100 years earlier, there were reformed synagogues in, um, in America in the 19th century. So I think part of the, I think part of the response to, or, or to your question about why are there orthodoxy is because there wasn't that kind of um, system to recruit or encourage or promote non-orthodoxy outside of uh, the U.S. and to some degree Canada. And then on a very practical level, in Israel, Orthodox synagogues are funded and Orthodox rabbis are paid by the state. So if, you, if you're an Israeli and you want to attach yourself to an Orthodox synagogue, it you know they you can contribute sadaka but there there's nothing resembling dues in the reform and conservative world um you pay dues uh because the state and this is changing slowly but the state doesn't support the conservative and reform movements in the state of israel and then also i would say another element is people correctly understand the, the lion's share I would say the heart of the reform and conservative movements are American based. And so for Israelis, that's sort of a foreign form of Judaism. So one of the things that's changing in Israel and has been for, you know, I would say about 25 years, maybe a little more, is the ordination of Israeli reform rabbis. Because the, the role of the synagogue in Israel is very different than the role of the synagogue in the U.S. In the U.S., the role of the synagogue is it's the heart of your life as being Jewish. In, in Israel, being in Israel is being Jewish. And the synagogue fulfills other, uh, other roles. But, but it is, it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, uh, Bryce, uh, I don't know, Alan, if your hand is still up. No, it's, it's, new. it's new. Okay, Bryce, go ahead. Yeah, so I thought that this is short. I thought the reform uh, movement got its start in Germany. The reform movement did get its start in Germany, but the heart of the reform movement today is certainly in the in North America and the United States. And I mean, there actually is a a, a, a seminary in 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 a reform liberal Jewish seminary seminary in London and and in Germany, but but. But by and large, Reform Judaism is predominantly an American movement. Anyway, it's not an Israeli movement. And it's only recently that we're starting to see uh, ordination of Israeli rabbis. Uh, Alan. Well, I was going to mention that tomorrow night in Jerusalem at HUC, they will ordain the latest batch of Israeli Reform rabbis. Uh, there's, uh, there's a small group of three. I'm just looking mm -hmm. at the list. Mm -hmm. And, the, and that will bring the total to almost 150 reform rabbis who were ordained in Israel, who's uh, not necessarily um, Israeli by background. Our, our friend mm -hmm. Rabbi Josh Weinberg, who's made the Aliyah, he was ordained as a, a rabbi at HUC in Jerusalem. But the, mm -hmm. the, these are, uh, I'm not disagreeing with you, Mike, uh, Rabbi, about yeah. the numbers, mm -hmm. is that it's a very recognized be a uh, phenomena within the reform movement not necessarily the government yes. and Absolutely. we have uh and we have uh you know this this whole rabbinic college which is comparable to the new york and los angeles ones yeah and it's interesting in that regard when what is now hebrew union college uh in jerusalem began it would not be accepted by the state of Israel as a seminary for reform rabbis. So it was an archaeological school. Um, and, oh, by the way, they were training rabbis. Um, and I'm training, you know, U.S. And, and foreign rabbis for a year in Israel. And but also, by the way, interestingly, it was absolutely the worst spot in Jerusalem you could possibly be 
because the the walls of Hebrew Union College was facing the old city of Jerusalem, uh, which before 1967 uh, basically had Jordanian snipers on the walls of the old city. So the walls at 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 HUC, you know, the older buildings that face the old city have tiny windows or no windows at all, because it was literally unsafe to be to be there. And then, of course, after 67, it became the best spot to be in Jerusalem because it has this these magnificent views of the old city. OK, so we're going to now actually turn to Reform Judaism. And Alan, if you don't mind continuing reading, uh, you sure. can. The largest affiliation of North American Jews, some 35% of Jews identify as reform, and that is a total of almost 2 million people. The uh, movement emphasizes the primacy of the Jewish ethical tradition over the obligations of Jewish law. The movement has traditionally sought to adapt Jewish tradition to modern sensibilities and sees itself as politically progressive and social justice oriented while emphasizing personal choice in matters of ritual observance. Major institutions, Union for Reform Judaism, which Rabbi already described, Human Union College, Jewish Institute, Jewish Institute of uh, Religion and Religious Action Center and the Central um, Conference of American Rabbis, although organizationally, I wouldn't have described it that way. <laughs> okay. It's, okay. It's, close. it's close. Okay. Well, when you write the article. <laughs> well, well uh, the, rack, the rack is not exactly a parallel thing, but it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> it, I, I think the Religious Action Center is strictly CCAR, is it not? No, nah, it's, it's, so uh, it, it's, it's really an independent affiliate, just like the Women for Reform Judaism. The uh, organizational thing gets a little messy because Rabbi Jonah Pesner is both a URJ vice president and director of the RAC. But that's really a, in, the, okay. in the weeds. Well, yeah, the, the, this the really is the weeds. It's really not important. So one of the things, and we're going to read about the history. Other articles have to do with history of different movements. Um, the reform movement, as I said, is continually reforming itself. And what you have over the years are the members of the CCAR getting together and trying to figure out what are the principles of reform Judaism. And they have changed dramatically over the years. Um, there is no single definition of what it means to be a reform Jew. Um, the description, I think, is is accurate. The way I define it, and the only, uh, the only validity I can ascribe to my own definition is I came up with this when I was writing my book uh, about Judaism, and I ran it by David Ellenson, who I considered to be the scholar of scholars, particularly in that field, and, and he said it was okay. So, um, so basically, what I would say, the essence of Reform Judaism is that ethical Jewish law, which I would say is Jewish law relating to how we deal with other people, animals, and the environment, is binding on all Jews. Ritual Jewish law is really a matter between you and God. So in the language of this article, personal choice in matters of ritual observance. Um, it is not true that, you know, there's sort of three octanes of Judaism. Um, and and I, I will tell you right off the bat to say something is very reform, is, ve is eh, maybe it's not very insulting, but it's insulting to describe non-observance as very reform is insulting. Reform mm -hmm. Judaism would teach what reform Jews do, God knows. Reform Judaism would say, you know, reform Judaism is open to all levels of observance. And it's, but it's understood that that's between you and God. It's really personal, uh, uh, personal choice and ritual observance, I, I think is a good way of describing it, which is certainly not true of the other major movements, as we will see in a moment. So, uh, Alan, you're, doing, you're on a roll. Would you like to read? Continue. Sure. Please. Now I'm going to get out of my uh, knowledge area. You know, I was good on the first part. Okay. <laughs> okay, but I can read it. Okay. No, known, known as Masorti, which in Hebrew means the word traditional, mm -hmm. Judaism outside of North America, conservative Judaism sees Jewish law as obligatory, though in practice, 
there is an enormous range of observance among conservative Jews. The movement has historically represented a midpoint on the spectrum of observance between Orthodox and reform, adopting certain innovations like driving to synagogue, but nowhere else on Shabbat and gender egalitarian prayer in most conservative uh, synagogues, but maintaining the traditional line on other matters like keeping kosher and, um, you know, this should be not in their marriage, but it does well, so it makes yeah, it sound tr like, yeah. Tr traditional okay. line on keeping kosher and intermarriage. The traditional in intermarriage, line on, the, on intermarriages don't do it. Right, it, there's opposite there. Anyway, that, that's the wording. Um, when, while it continues to bar its rabbis for officiating in interfaith weddings, the movement has liberalized its approach to intermarriage, inter, intermarriage somewhat in recent years. About 18% of American Jews identify as conservative major institutions, the JTS, U US University, the United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism, Rabbinic Assembly, Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies. These are all the counterparts to the reform movement. Yes, so the seminaries are the Jewish Theological Seminary and the Ziegler School, which is part of American Jewish University. United Synagogue of Conservative Judaism is like URJ. It's the it's the um, the uh, congregational arm. And the Rabbinical Assembly is the organization of rabbis. I think it's, it's actually interesting to mention what they mean by liberalizing its approach until fairly recently a conservative rabbi was would not be allowed to attend an interfaith wedding even if the interfaith wedding included his or her own child and that was a huge issue for conservative rabbis you can imagine uh and you know and and, and their families so that got liberalized. Conservative rabbis still are strictly forbidden from officiating at interfaith marriages. And it is not unusual at all for me to have couples referred to me by their conservative rabbis, you know, that are friends of mine, um, be, because the, the couple is, uh, is uh, it's, it's an interfaith uh, couple. Can, I, can, you, can you tell me why? why um, they don't let the rabbi officiate at interfaith weddings? Yeah, because quite simply, the question is, what is a Jewish wedding? And traditionally, a Jewish wedding is a, mar is a wedding between two Jews. So, so the, the simplest explanation is a, a rabbi has no authority to officiate at a wedding that isn't a Jewish wedding. Um, that's that's the simplest explanation. But I would say behind that is a very powerful sense that interfaith marriages are a threat to to Jewish survival. I don't agree with that, by the way. But but there, you know, back when when some of us were growing up, well, I often describe this. My father would say he could no more marry a non-Jew than marry a Martian. For him, the idea of marrying a non-Jew was inconceivable. And, you know, and in reality, his family would would shun him if he married a non-Jew, and the Christian family would not be too happy with the Christians marrying into a Jewish family. In my generation, it was a, a shanda, which is a Yiddish word for a shame. And, and people would, you know, not be... Uh, very open or excited about it um and then i would say in my children's generation um the focus is on whether the person is a good person i'm just now reacting to people now i'm a reformed rabbi so the people that come to me for such weddings are typically delighted with their sons and daughters-in-law who are not jewish because they're wonderful people and um but but even in my world um when you know before I entered rabbinical school, so you go back 25, 30 years, I would say only about a third of reform rabbis would officiate at interfaith weddings and congregations would forbid, reform congregations would forbid their rabbis for, 
from conducting interfaith marriages. Um, and the CCAR, I think, is still officially opposed to interfaith marriages, but leaves to the rabbi the decision. I would say these days, more than two thirds of reform rabbis will officiate at interfaith marriages. And quite often, a condition of hiring a rabbi will be that the rabbi agrees to officiate at interfaith weddings. So the reform movement has changed dramatically on on that question. The conservative movement, I wouldn't say has changed dramatically, but at least has made it less oppressive so that you know a rabbi can attend his child's wedding uh, if the child is marrying uh, outside of uh, outside of Judaism. Alan. Um, yeah, I thought when you were going to put conditions, I thought it would be on the marriage, not on the rabbi. So what I wanted to say is um, my early experience with Rabbi Alan Greenbaum, when he conducted a interfaith um, um, wedding, he did put a condition, at least without enforcement, that the non-Jewish partner would agree to would have a Jewish household mm -hmm. and, and raise children to be Jewish. Now, Obviously, uh, rabbis never follow up and find out whether they do that. But the the idea was to encourage the point, Rabbi, you just made about Jewish mm -hmm. continuity, that the conservative movement makes it simpler. You just can't do it. But right. in the reform, so I don't know what the numbers are, but I know rabbis that I know today and, and the knowledge I learned from Rabbi Greenbaum is a long time ago, but is that that that. Um, Reform rabbis don't just let the non uh, non Jewish partner off the hook; that like it doesn't matter. It matters to the reform rabbi. Yeah, that that, that that that's an individual choice of the rabbi. It it is. It is okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's also true of the Catholics. If a, a Catholic priest will marry, you know, will perform the but on the condition that they raise their kids as Catholics. I know for have friends that have been there yes. Yes. like i did and, and didn't require that <laughs> yeah so 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 again different catholics actually have a lot of rules and i and i have worked with catholics you know in interfaith marriages and i am at the extreme liberal end of this because i will actually work with other clergy at a wedding and i would say my guess is that's like five or ten percent of even reform rabbis will officiate with another member of the clergy. My own feeling is to be open and welcoming to the couple. They are getting married. Uh, they are, you know, back in my father's day and maybe even in my day, if the rabbi wouldn't marry you, you know, you might actually change your mind about getting married. That Those days no longer exist. I actually worked for a guy who was a brilliant guy and uh, he married a non-Jew. Uh, he, probably my age, he could not find, maybe older, he could not find a rabbi who would officiate and his his grandmother, his bubby, would insist on there being a rabbi there. So he hired an actor uh, to play the rabbi. I mean, they had a civil wedding another time. And for purposes of the family celebration, he hired a rabbi. And the only mistake he made uh, that would have saved him from a very costly divorce was having the civil wedding. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good story. OK. Uh, Orthodox Judaism. Alan, why don't you continue? Want me to continue? Okay, sure. sure. Orthodox Jews are defined by their adherence to a traditional understanding of Jewish law as interpreted by rabbinic authorities over the centuries. Hallmarks of Orthodox religious life, including strict observance of Shabbat, no driving, no working, no turning electricity on and off, or handling money. And of uh, and of kosher law and uh, following of kosher laws, though numerically the smallest of the three, the big three, <laughs> sounds like a football network. Um, some ten percent of American Jews identify as Orthodox. Orthodox Jews have larger than average families, and their offsprings are statistically more likely to remain observant Jews. Unlike the Reform and Conservative movements which have a recognized leadership that sets policy for movement affiliated institutions. Orthodox Judaism is a looser category that can be 
further subdivided as follows. Good. Yeah, and, and before we get into that subdivision, one of the what I would say a major difference between orthodox and conservative is conservative rabbis see themselves as more free to actually change Jewish law. They don't do it willy-nilly or lightly. They will actually study Talmudic principles and make decisions about Jewish law. They are actually doing what traditional Jews did in Talmudic times. The, the rabbis of the Talmud, those of us that have studied Talmud are, are very aware of this, the rabbis of the Talmud uh, were very free to change the laws that were found in the Torah. And the best example of that, that, that immediately comes to mind is the idea of an eye for an eye. Um, the Torah says three times, if somebody knocks out your eye, you knock out their eye. And the rabbis, by an you know, interesting way, uh, proved that God did not mean that, even though it's repeated three times. Um, so basically what they were doing was by logic, and, and by, by serious, formal, organized logic, not just pulling things out of the air, uh, creating Jewish law. And so what the conservative movement does, is the way I would characterize it, is they continue to do that um, to respond to the times in ways that orthodoxy doesn't see themselves free from, from doing so. And maybe a good example is in the conservative world, you can drive to the nearest synagogue you can't on Shabbat. You can't drive anywhere else, but the the value of attending the, a synagogue on Shabbat is deemed to be greater than the prohibition against making a fire, uh, or uh, that's that's you know that is really what restricts. So are you you mean to tell me it's all uh, an Orthodox Jew who has to has to go to shul on a Saturday morning and it's closer for him to go to a reformed synagogue rather than a orthodox synagogue? No, I'm talking about conservative Judaism. And I don't know whether they would say go to a reform or an orthodox one, but they would say you can drive to the nearest synagogue. And I don't know the details. Mm -hmm. that, that's, know. that's what I mean, Rabbi. If, if, if let, Let's just say I'm conservative. Right. And Shabbos comes, and I, I normally don't drive on Shabbos mm -hmm. in this situation. However, so I, I, I drive, and there is a, a dot Elohim is closer than Eskayim. Yeah, the answer is I don't know the answer. Okay. I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. Helena. Something we can yeah, uh, the two of the conservative synagogues that I know of in Denver have become almost orthodox. Um, and I know the one in Teaneck, the Jewish Community Center, Center also is almost orthodox. And here, both conservative synagogues have set up, they have two chapels now, and one of them has a mahitza. So have the congregation- Mahitza is separating, that, separating yeah, men, men and women. For men from women. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, do you, I, I know that the conservative movement as the reform movement was growing, the conservative movement has shrunk a bit. Mm -hmm. And is, do you think that um, maybe they're leaning more towards orthodoxy? Yeah, so it, it's, it's a very <laughs> good question. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the things I was gonna ask you is when you say that they've become almost orthodox, you know, in what way is that true? And clearly a major dividing line mm -hmm. is separating men and women. Because mm -hmm. you can't, you can't be. I was going to say you can't be loosey goosey about that. Yeah, you can have a big mechitza where the men and women can't see each other. In many even Orthodox synagogues, you might have the women on one side of the of an aisle and the men on another side with a velvet rope down the middle. So it's not a, yeah. a no. major separation. Um, major. So, so what I would say is, as a matter of practice, and we'll get into this discussion. Um, in terms of what do individual Jews do, Reform Judaism and Conservative Judaism are becoming more and more alike. And if, you know, I would say most people attending a 
reform and conservative synagogue would not know the difference unless you're really tuned to specific phrases or, you know, in an evening service, a Friday night service, the Amidah is only said silently in a, con in a conservative mm. uh, synagogue and it's out loud in a reform. But unless you're sort of an aficionado of such things, uh, you wouldn't know the difference. Um, and in Canada, it's not unusual to have conservative synagogues with the Mechitza. It mm -hmm. is, I would say it's very unusual in the U.S. <laughs> I've actually never heard of one, uh, but but you're well, telling we have me it here. But you're telling me there are. So what oh, I yeah, think because I studied there, and even to study with the rabbi, he he wanted men and women to separate okay. in the room. So, itself. so what I would, if I had to guess what's going mm -hmm. on, what I would guess is that conservative synagogues that are at the liberal end of things, yeah, are so close to reform that those congregations are merging, yeah. and what's left behind are more orthodox in mm -hmm. in their practice and probably yeah. will become orthodox and you know it's a question where they now the the big question of course would be do they pay their dues to the 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 mm -hmm. uh the cons what's the organization united synagogue or somewhere else and i and i i you probably i don't know yeah I don't alan. Know that. okay alan so um my understanding on this thing which was described as mixed seating was the hallmark of what um, when the when the people in the 19th century were not happy with the dropping of all the rituals and the things that was defined a little earlier in this article about reform Judaism uh, giving up on rituals and just sticking with the uh, 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 you know uh, uh, values and stuff that the people who were unhappy they the conservative movement always, um, included mixed seating. That was the one mod modernity. But you guys are saying that conservative synagogues actually don't let men and women. Some don't. Allow some, men. yeah. And that's, my understanding, my understanding thing. was, and I haven't tracked it, that that is a Canadian phenomenon more than a U.S. phenomenon. But it doesn't surprise me that. So, so it, that I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's new to me. My other point, uh, Michael, if you're going to cover this now or later, is my understanding of how some of these practices evolved within the movements is through a system called responses. Yes. So, so um, we'll talk about this. Responsa are specific legal decisions about a very particular point. Like driving on Shabbat, right? Like, drive, the... like driving on Shabbat. Yeah, that's why I and, brought it. And, okay. and so... That's that is a traditional thing, even in the Orthodox world. Um, you know, mm -hmm. you can imagine electricity gets invented. You're not going to find a discussion of electricity anywhere in the Jewish texts. So my guess is someone asked a Jewish scholar and authority, what's the nature of electricity <laughs> from the standpoint of Jewish law? And in, in the Orthodox world, there aren't responsive committees. There's scholars. And your, you know, your group within Orthodoxy, we're going to read about that in a moment, uh, would follow a scholar like J uh, Joseph Soloveitchik. Or if you were a Chabad, you would follow the Chabad rulings. In the conservative movement and the reform movement, there are something, uh, there there are responsa committees and law committees. In, in the reform movement, it's a responsa committee. And in the Orthodox movement, it's called the, it's called the, the law committee. One of the things which is interesting is I would say most Reformed Jews that I know don't struggle with Jewish law. Um, there's a, a, a phrase that I think was invented by the Reconstructionist yeah. movement, which is that Jewish law gets a vote but not a veto. Um, I would say people come to me to ask questions about Jewish law. The old joke, I think this was invented by... Uh, by Harold Schulweis is when they are hatched, matched, and dispatched. Um, namely, ceremonies around birth, ceremonies around marriage, and ceremonies around funerals. People are very focused on what's what does Jewish law say, and I'm I'm saying now even in the reform world. Um, it isn't. Oh, sorry. But don't we have the Ten Commandments? We have the Ten Commandments. Does every form of Judaism? support the ten, ten commandments every form of that? judaism has the identical torah 
right the question okay so so let let's that's a perfect example so in the ten commandments is a commandment about not doing particular kinds of work on the sabbath okay and so i would say in the reform world most reform jews and most reform rabbis don't are not strictly sabbath observant they all recognize that this text is in the torah but okay. what they would say is ritual issues like keeping the sabbath are are subject to your own interpretation whereas in the conservative movement and the orthodox movement they would not say that so it's a question of interpreting each commandment no uh, it's, no. it's a question no, no so let me be clear it is i would say in in orthodox and conservative movements jewish law is binding on all jews period whether the jews Okay. Obey Jewish law is between is is a matter of personal choice. In the reform movement, I would say ethical Jewish laws, how we treat one another animals in the environment is binding. But ritual laws, do you have to have a mezuzah on every doorpost? Do you have to pray three times a day? Do you have to keep strictly kosher? Do you have yeah. to be strictly Sabbath observant? The, those are really between you and God. So um, you would say the Ten Commandments are not ritual commandments? Th some of the Ten Commandments are ritual, such as observing the Sabbath, and okay. some of them are ethical, such as not stealing and not murdering and not committing adultery and honoring your parents. Okay. So uh, they, they, they're they they're both. Uh, the, the first four are ritual and the last six are... Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. Uh, 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 go ahead, Stephen, as long as you're talking, and I'll call on Jane. Okay. The thing is, this may, in five minutes, my thing about it more, I decided it's a stupid idea, but the, you said about how, obviously, there's no mention in Jewish text of electricity until recently. Right. Um, past in, I think it's Exodus, Moses, we, 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 the normal translation is burning bush, but what it says basically, and we know we sometimes trans we don't translate things perfectly because there's words that don't have exact translations. Moses sees this thing that's giving off light and heat as though it was on fire, except it's not consumed. So maybe that's talking about um, something electric. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. Uh, actually, it is even a better example. The modern Hebrew word for electricity is chashmal. And in, um, in Ezekiel, they talk about Chashmal from the heavens, and it's understood, you know, by scholars to mean a f like lightning or a fiery appearance. But when I was in an Israeli solar energy company, they loved that one because we were taking electricity from from the heavens. So I would say the issue arose nonetheless. Once you have a light bulb, am I allowed to turn that on or sh and shut it off on the Sabbath? Going to the burning bush doesn't help me in that that question so the rabbis had to decide ultimately what they decided is a um is a uh, electricity is fire and all the rules that we've accumulated about how we handle fire on the sabbath for example we're going to apply to electricity uh jane uh yeah. i don't know if you covered this earlier because i was unavoidably detained but yesterday, as you might know, there was this huge thing in Washington. Sunday, actually, yes. No, yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Oh, the, the rally, the 300. There was 000. a huge rally yes. in Washington, yes. D.C. On Monday? No, on, on yesterday. On Tuesday? Tuesday. Yesterday. Yeah, oh, okay. Tuesday. 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 Yes, yes Tuesday. right. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm, so yeah. I'm just curious as to whether that is something that the Orthodox would have joined. Yeah, yes, I, yes they, absolutely. They did. Or, every, every movement of any politics, it was really very diverse. Yes. Well, my qu my question is, if the Orthodox joined, did that mean that the Orthodox men would have been in a separate thing from the Orthodox women? So what I would say is, I mean, it's Orthodox good. people commute in New York City and they ride in subways and and 
you know, they would they would try to as much as practical, and I'll use the word practical, okay. avoid bumping into and having direct contact with women in, in a, what would they would consider to be an immodest way. All right. So they so there wouldn't have been a separate section. Not I'm I yeah. doubt it, but I'm no. Okay. No. no. Okay. Yeah, I Okay, know. I think what's confusing you the McKeats the thing that's specifically for praying Prayer. and a few other specific things. It's not a twenty four hour thing. We're yes. never be in the same place at the same time. But yes. there are yes. little that's things like you can't shake a man can't shake hands with a woman or hug a woman unless it's a wife or, or right, spouse or, or, yeah. or daughter. Uh, yes, that's true. And that's actually true in Islam as well. Um, well am, I supposed to, am I supposed to agree with a rabbi's decision? Are you what? supposed to agree with a rabbi's decision? Decision, yeah. Yes. So if so now I'm, I'm talking clearly not in reform <laughs> because sometimes <laughs> I don't even agree with my decision. <laughs> um, but I would say in, in the in a world where you consider Jewish law binding upon you and okay. you have a question um, that you don't know the answer to, you would ask your rabbi. If the rabbi knows the answer, he he or she will give you the answer. And yes, you're supposed to abide by that. There is a general rule, as I understand it, against rabbi shopping. You know, I'll ask a you know, six rabbis until I get the answer I like. Um, and, and of course, if the rabbi doesn't know the answer, he or she will submit the question to a responsa committee and they will do the research and come up with the answer. And actually a fair number, I would say, um, the books from here to here are all collections of responsa in Jewish law because I personally am fascinated by that subject. Um, but but anyway, yes, um, yeah. So I, there's a bunch of hands up. I actually don't know who who still has a question. So if if you have a question, yeah, uh, or want to make a comment, go ahead, Alan. I just wanted to go back to the Shabbat and the Ten Commandments, um, and, and because I I my understanding is one of the wonderful, and I don't mean that negatively, inventions of the rabbis in the Talmudic period was to answer the question, what does work mean? And I believe there's 39 things that you're prohibited not to do and everything else is okay, if that's the right number. So yes. the contribution of rabbinic before the response system, which has been t doing things like bioethics and transplants and other things that, that needed to be mm -hmm. done by responses, I'm not, that's not good English, but is that the rabbis also figured out that's where the details of um, of, of work means in Shabbat. Yes. So, so the only thing I would add is to color your statement slightly. If you were a, a traditional rabbi or even a non-traditional rabbi like me, uh, you would recognize that what, what the rabbis were doing, I mean, what, the 39 categories of work are in the Mishnah. The okay. tradition is the Mishnah was given by God to Moses on Sinai. So it's not the rabbis cooking this up at least that's not what they would say. They would say this was Torah given to oral Torah given by God to Moses. But and, before the second century, let's use that point about the rabbi got it from Moses. What, what did people do when the temple existed and you were observing Shabbat and you had questions about, those yeah, we, we, things, we, you know, and it's we really don't know. Yeah, we don't. Know. Um, and again, we had some interesting discussion here uh, about how observant were Jews far back in history. And the, there was this article which we read together and was a, a book um, also in book forum, which asked the question, what can we learn from archaeology about how observant Jews were? And the answer that they came up with is if you go back to se 2nd century BCE and before, there are evidences of Jewish communities. There's evidence of them not being terribly observant, and you don't have a lot of positive evidence of them being observant. And what can you find from archaeology? You can find bones of what kind of animals were being eaten in Jewish communities, and you can find mezuzahs and even even some tefillin scrolls 
uh, and uh, and coins. And so so there's some really interesting um, things you you can learn f from from that. Rabbi, um, where, where where is it written? Where is it written about you cannot drive a car on Shabbos? So what what is I'll tell you where it's written in the Mishnah. In the Mishnah, you say. It, hold on, it, hold on. Let me finish my sentence, well, Jay. Well, Jay, let me finish my sentence. You know, I can't remember things. <laughs> the The Mishnah is part of the oral law. It would that which was always oral, written down in the year two hundred of the Common Era. It says you cannot start or stop a fire on the Sabbath, and the rabbis basically say. What's in a car, it's electricity or it's actual fire. So therefore, a, you don't drive a car on the Sabbath. There actually so this some... didn't come out until the second century. I'm sorry? This did not come out until the second century. If you're a traditional Jew, you would say God gave that rule to Moses on Sinai. Uh, that's, where I, that's where I'm trying to get at. So yes. God gave this rule to Moses. And then the Jews started to follow the seven rules. What seven rules? That you couldn't ride on Saturday. Yeah. <clears throat> when, does that mean they, they couldn't ride a horse or a donkey or a camel? No, no. We're talking about fire. But you're, you're not allowed to carry objects outside of your domain more than three or four cubits on the Sabbath. So if you're inside a walled city, no problem. If you, anyway, I really don't want to get into it. It's really beyond the discussion. So, okay. uh, Bryce. I, I'm sorry. I, uh, oh, yeah. So when uh, rabbis uh, are asked by the congregation for an opinion on, or not an opinion, but, what, you a know, ruling. what it is. Rule, well, is it a ruling? Is the rabbi actually giving his opinion? Well, so. If the opinion is in the form of what you should do, it's a ruling. I have only done one such ruling in my entire life where I had, I think I talked about it. I had I had all of three days experience being a rabbi and we were having a conversion of a woman who was a lesbian and her partner was there. And normally a woman can be a witness to another woman's immersion in a mikvah. And so this, her partner, who, by the way, was the president of my congregation, wanted to be a witness for her partner's immersion for purposes of conversion. And I ruled that she could not. I ruled that their intimate relationship was more important than their gender. So that's, that's, that is a takana. That is a ruling. And I am delighted. And the light doesn't capture my pleasure at this is I actually discussed this a month ago with Elliot Dorf, who is, I think, the leading legal mind in the Jewish world. And he agreed with me. <laughs> and to my knowledge, it hasn't come up. I've actually researched it, uh, but it hasn't come up. Um, or maybe nobody thought to. Uh, hold on a second. Stephen, uh, you have your hand up. Oh, maybe he's not there. Alan, go ahead. Uh, this is interesting because there's a broader subject called witness. You caused me to think. So all the places where we're reminded that you have to have a witness in a in a in a Jewish uh, trial, the arm's length part, you can't be too um, familiar or too close a to relation to be a legitimate. It, it applies yeah, to you. Yeah, point. that's actually an interesting point. It, that that one didn't even occur to me. It, it was the issue of gender I was focusing on. Clearly, in an immersion, the person immersing male or female is naked so it's considered improper for a someone of the opposite gender to be a physical witness um even if it's a husband um okay. of 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 a woman converting um and so so anyway so i i issued a ruling i may have been wrong and you know and and probably if there were time you know the person could have submitted i i could have submitted that to the responsive committee in fact, I probably should have. But Rabbi uh, Dorf, but even though it was a while later, he, he he supported your logic. Yeah, he supported my logic. And he also <laughs> reported that the first time he issued a takana, I can't remember what it was, he said he was absolutely wrong, as he later found out, <laughs> which made me feel good. He's a great uh, guy. Rabbi, Rabbi, isn't yes. the 
isn't the Torah that we read from on Shabbat yes. identical to every possible form of Judaism? Yes. It's identical. Yes. They can't do anything about it. They can't change anything there. No, we don't change the Torah. Absolutely okay. true. Okay. Okay. Absolutely true. Okay. Let's. We just ignore the inconvenient. I'm sorry? I'm kidding. That was a joke. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Not total joke, but it's fair. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's let's finish Orthodox and then we'll we'll pick this up again uh, next time. Modern Orthodox. Uh, I, I don't remember who was reading. Was it Alan? Uh, Alan. Was me. Yeah. In, somebody want somebody want to jump no, in? Go ahead. Fin okay, finish. Okay. Where, where it Modern is. Orthodox, also known as Centrist Orthodoxy, this movement was an e a f effort to harmonize traditional observance of Jewish law with secular modernity. Its ideal is summed up in the motto of its flagship institution, New York's Yeshiva, Yeshiva University, Torah Amada, Umada. Umada, mm -hmm. literally Torah and secular knowledge. I don't understand what that means. And major institutions, Yeshiva University, Rabbinic Council of America and Orthodox uh, Union. Those are all the Orthodox pieces though, right? Yes, those, these those are, are mo modern Orthodox. So. For example, you know, um, the the Kushners, uh, uh, President Trump's daughter-in-law, uh, President Trump's daughter and son-in-law are modern Orthodox. Uh, the newest um, um, ambassador to Israel, Jack Lew, who I, I know personally from my from my prior business career, is modern Orthodox. Compared to Haredi or ultra orthodox so let's read the paragraph a couple of paragraphs on that that's the typically marked this is Brady, <coughs> right under the photo right Where we are yes okay. yeah 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 okay go slide up a little bit so yep. i can okay sorry typically marked by their distinctive black hats for men and modest attire for women haredi or haredi orthodox jews are the most stringent in their commitment to Jewish law and tend to have the lowest level of interaction with the wider non-Jewish society. One major exception is Hasidic. Judaism's Chabad Lubavitch sect, which is known for its outreach to the wider Jewish community, Haredi Orthodox Jews, who are represented in the United States as Agudath, Agudath, Israel of America can be further subdivided into two principal mm -hmm. groups. Hasidic, Hasidic Jews, there are heirs to um, heirs, are heirs of the spiritual revivalist movement that began in Eastern Europe in the 18th century and draw and drawing on the Jewish mystical tradition, emphasizing emphasize direct communi communion with the divine through ecstatic prayer and joy and worship. There are a number of distinct sects, most headed by charismatic Rabbi Rebbe, including Chabad, Satmar, Ger, and Skvir. I didn't know of those. Yeah, there are about 20 different Hasidic groups. And they so basically, somebody, their, their yeah. origins are by the city that they started in. And so they're the, all Ashkenazi, is what? Yeah, it's all it's all Ashkenazi. Yes. Okay. All right, the last one here. Um, sometimes yeshivish. Wow, I don't know that yeshivish. Sometimes yeshivish, and also litvish, are Haredi Jews are heirs to the mitnagdim. Mitnagdim, yes. Okay, literally opponents who rejected the rise of Hasidic Judaism in. In Europe, these Jews traditionally emphasize the intellectual aspect of Jewish life, particularly rigorous Talmud study for men. Yeshivish derived from the word yeshiva or religious seminary. Yeah, I've never heard the word yeshivish or litvish. I've heard litvak. And, yeah. And the interesting thing here is that the general name that they are given is mitnagdim, which literally means opponents. Opponents of who? The Hasidim. So this was a, a group of ultra-Orthodox Jews that arose particularly to be in opposition with the Hasidic groups. Okay, we'll read so, one can more. Can I sec ask a, a yeah, question? Go ahead. So these variations of Orthodoxy 
um, raise the question in my mind, because when I get into a discussion occasionally with an Orthodox rabbi or mm -hmm. orthodox, mainly a rabbi, you know, they think there's only one way to be Jewish. Their that's, way. Well, but that's the point. That's OK. I understand that that I'm not the kind of being Jewish that right, they right. when they're. But when within their universe of these several communities, is there they they must be disagreeing on the right way to be Jewish among these sects? Yes? Yeah. So the the simple the answer is yes, and the simplest example of that is how many different certifying organizations there are for Kashrut. I have a booklet. Once somebody gave me, there were thirty two different. Okay. I, yeah, I would have guessed twenty. So and different groups follow different rules for what is kosher and what is non-kosher and that's a, a clear you know um obvious issue but they're yeah all reform, but they never admit it that's all they're just reform <laughs> they're reform in a way that they've identified no 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 no, no so what i would say is i mean i take your question seriously yeah right. what they would say is if you have questions of Jewish law, ask your rabbi. And if your rabbi doesn't know, he will ask his rabbi and his scholar, which in the Chabad world is only Chabad. And if you have a Litvak or Mitmagdim rabbi, they're going to come up with different answers. And so so there are many different movements. I would call them sub-movements within orthodoxy. Uh, and they will have different answers. Let's read one more paragraph and then we'll... We'll, we'll continue next time. Open open Orthodox. Um, the newest subject, a newest subset of Orthodoxy, Open Orthodox, was founded in the 1990s by the New York Rabbi Avi Weiss. And it's, its inherents who consider the movement a reaction to a perceived shift to the right among the modern Orthodox generally support expanded roles for women in spiritual leadership and more openness to non-Orthodox Jews. Major institutions are Yeshivat Chovere Torah and, Yish and Yeshivat Maharat. Yeah. Never heard of any yeah, of those. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm not familiar with that as a movement, but one of the phenomena that you see in this world is in the good old days, you know, you go back to the shtetl and I would say before this, before the 17th, the 19th century, you would have rabbis who were all across the spectrum on different levels of observance. And, you know, and by and large, that was OK. Now that we have options like reform and conservative Judaism, the rabbis who tend to be more liberal in their observance will leave orthodoxy and become part of conservative or reform Judaism. So what's left behind? What's left behind are more and more conservative, small c, rabbis. The Hebrew term is machmir, more and more observant. So particularly in the Ashkenazi world, and remember, this is all Ashkenazi. This doesn't exist in the Sephardic world. In the no. Ashkenazi world, the Why? liberal, the liberal. Hold on, we can talk about that. The liberal rabbis are are liberal Orthodox rabbis tend to leave, except for this new group, Open Orthodox. And what's left behind are more and more uh, rigorously observant. My own theory on why it never developed in the Ashkenazi world, in the Sephardic world, is the Ashkenazi world by and large are Jews living. I don't think I'll stop sharing so it'll be a little easier for seeing us the ashkenazi world by and large are jews living in christian lands and christianity as i'll be discussing next tuesday have a theological chip on their shoulder about judaism so the jews were isolated in ghettos and and restricted in their interaction with the with the christian world so it became more and more inwardly focused and so ultimately that results in movements like reform who, who want to interact with the non-Jewish world. In the Sephardic world, by and large, these are Jews living in Muslim lands and the Muslims don't have the same theological chip on their shoulder 
about Judaism. Islam is much closer to Judaism theologically than is Christianity. So it was very common for Jews and Muslims to interact together and to get along together. And so there was never a, a need or a push to develop into these separate movements. So if you go to Sephardic communities, you will find some Sephardic Jews who are very observant, some Sephardic Jews who are, who are you know, less observant than, than most Reformed Jews that I know. And they're all praying together. When they pray together, they're in a synagogue that we would describe as Orthodox, so men and women are separate. But when they're living out in the community, you know, are, are, are men and women not shaking hands or women dressing modestly? Um, by and large, no. And so they're much more relaxed about their observance in the Sephardic world. It's, it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, yeah, Alan. If we're, well, we don't have to cover this for out of time, but way back when we were talking the pieces of the pieces of the movement, I wanted to raise the question about the cantors. So the reform movement and the conservative movement have their own identity of um, of, of the clergy uh, groups, at least those two movements that I'm more familiar with, American Co Conference of Cantors. Yes, they, for the they have their reform. own organizations. And that leads to when you were talking about these sects and stuff, I, I also know that the chanting and the cantillation, uh, the trope for Sephardic is different than Ashkenazi. Yeah, but, but the trope for Moroccan is different from Sephardic. The trope for Casablanca is different than the large larger Moroccan. Even so, within Sephardi. Yeah, it's they're the, all Sephardi. They all so, okay. So yeah, so that's yeah. that's uh Okay, I didn't know that. Okay. Not, Never okay. I, I I just felt like it was about to be a tangent. So I'll back yeah, I'll, yeah, stop. Yeah, I'll stop. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? We will pick up at this point uh, next time, Jerry. Yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, it's also a bit of a numbers game, right? You know, the number of uh, Ashkenaz and, and descendants of just much larger than the Sephardic. And so, you know, you just naturally then you're going to potential for more splits, things like that. And not, not in belief Israel. systems, not in Israel, Jerry. Yeah, not in Israel. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not talking about Israel. I'm not, I'm not talking about yeah. Israel. Yeah. Okay, I'm being very specific about saying, you know, overall globally, the number, right, much larger. So you're going to naturally get more splits. Uh, and also, actually, there I, are I, some... I, I actually, I don't know if that's true. Yeah, yeah me too. Um, I'm not it... sure, Jerry. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, okay. it is true. And I can, okay. we can spend a lot of time okay. talking about it. But, okay. you know, but, and even in the Sephardic community, there are some splits, even amongst themselves. They do have splits and subtle beliefs that are different between East and West. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, yes, Moroccan Jews have different prayer books than Turkish Jews and different customs and yeah. different dietary customs. Um, yeah. So, yes. so it depends but, on how you want to define it. Right. I mean, that's that's the thing. We went through a narrow definition of it through here. We, we just talked about in, uh, you know, the different groups. And like, for example, and even in modern orthodoxy, we were talking about uh, the split when, that happened in Vilnius back uh, a few hundred years ago between you know, when the, um, uh, you know, different belief systems started coming up and, and, you know, so that even carries over into today into the way people look at things. You know, there was a very monumentous, uh, you know, thing that happened when, when they, uh, you know, they, they, they split that up there in uh, Lithuania back when. So, you know, there, there's some subtlety there, which I think, you know, the article just, of course, trying to, in, in brevity, didn't get a chance to explain, but, you know, there, there are definitely differences and, and a lot of variations depending on how and you And by the way, I, I distributed a total of four articles. This was the first one. There are There's an article each on Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox Judaism that we will read in coming weeks. Yeah. Um, and I will just mention, I will be here next Monday. The following Monday, I am getting a new hip. And uh, that, that day, and my guess is I will not be up to leading a discussion that well, it's about time i mean you know maybe you'll be able to get the jokes better yes i'll be a wait, little wait, wait clarify there's class on monday but not on wednesday no there's class on monday i think wednesday is that era of thanksgiving yes yeah yeah my, yeah there won't be a class on wednesday yeah so yes yes so thank you for pointing out because today is wednesday yeah my, my my guess is everybody's busy next wednesday and i don't know about the following wednesday um You'll have Probably to let us know how you are. Sorry? 
Please let us know how you are after the surgery. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, as soon as you wake up, we'll get back an email. Where I, when I was growing up, and I, I may not remember this accurately, but the way I remember it was that what was dominant then where I was, was reconstructionist and conservative, and that orthodox and reform were kind of the out, the two outliers at each extreme. Where was and this? It was sort of a, uh, New Jersey. And I'm probably not remembering it well, just based, and instead just remembering what I knew about, or, but in any case, but it, in, in your in your physicist, you know about bell curves and how there tends to be more of what's in the more in the middle and less at each extreme. But now, and you know this because you were rabbi at, um, <coughs> in Camarillo at one point. Camarillo has reform has kabod has nothing in between. No conservative, right. no modern orthodox, no reconstructionist. And in this, and I think in Ventura County, there, there's some conservative, but it is dom predominantly reform and kabod. Yes. And so it's sort of an inverted bell curve where there's a lot at each extreme and very little in the middle. And is that a regional thing between the East Coast and the West Coast? Or is that something that's changed over time between when I was a kid and now? Yeah. So so Reconstructionist Judaism is tiny. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure why you're mentioning. Because I have to grow up in a town where there was but one. Probably there was a, a Reconstructionist synagogue right near where you were. So I would say reform is growing. Conservative Judaism is shrinking, and Chabad is always growing because they're very aggressive about growing, and um, and so there aren't enough Jews in Ventura County to support. There is a conservative synagogue in Ventura County. It's called Am Hayam in Ventura. It's small and and very elderly, um, but it's there, and that's isn't there one in Thousand Oaks. There's one in Thousand Oaks, yes. Yeah, I don't and know that's if that's Ventura County. County. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm thinking more, yeah, on this side okay. of the hill. Yes, there's Etz Chaim in, in Ventura County. But okay. but Chabad is just very aggressive about sending their people out, and they're very effective about raising money. And so there's a lot of Chabads. How many, how many people are actually affiliated with different movements? I really don't know. But my guess is it's predominantly reform. On the West Coast, I would say conservative is is less of a percentage than on the East Coast, um, but that but that's a guess. I don't actually have the numbers. Okay, I do have one number. It's eight eighteen, and so we will stop recording. <laughs>